Welcome to this engaging workshop, How UNO's Rebuilt Its Tech Stack for the Future of Guest Engagement. Patronix and its customer UNO's Pizzeria and Grill will share do's and don'ts of change management. They'll learn the hard questions to ask and how to overcome the internal resistance to change. Please welcome Andrew Robbins, Chief Executive Officer of Patronix, and Regina Jerome, Senior Vice President of Information Technology Uno Restaurants. All right, uh, thank you all for coming, and I'm so excited to be doing this with my friend Regina. Uh, we've done this five times together, so maybe four. Last time was great. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. So, and um, most of the time we're just going to have a chat and talk through change management. But I thought we'd start introducing ourselves with a couple slides. So um, this is me, Andrew Robbins, CEO, co-founder of Patronic Systems. A little bit about my background. All I wanted to do as a kid was uh, to uh, build jet airplanes, and I did that for about 11 years um, with GE aircraft engines. And then I worked at a door and window company, building residential doors and windows, which clearly makes me the only person that has the right to start a digital guest engagement company. So that's my background, and I've done that for 21 years. So lucky that when you start a company, um, I think uh, our third customer was Regina. And to find someone who can match your passion and the business knowledge to go with the technical to help make things successful. So what's digital guest engagement? It's all these things that you need to, um, to meet the guests where they are. And they're on their phones a lot. They're at the POS, they're ordering online, they're at DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, um, they're on social media. And so we have a, a, a platform that does loyalty, online ordering, gift cards, everything they need. And really what we help you do is align these things. And because there's, there's best in breed of all the things, but if they don't work well together, what you get um, is slow, it isn't fast, it doesn't do what you want. And so we really help you align these things we work with tons and tons of brands. We work with 1,800 uh, brands, 40,000 locations. You use our tech every single day. Um, and and we, um, we have something like 225 million guest port, uh, profiles that we're always running artificial intelligence on. So that's really quick, a little bit about us. And then I'm going to turn it over to Regina. I think I got it. You got it. I got it. Thank you. Whoops. Whoa. Hi, everybody. I'm Regina. Uh-oh. Which way is which? OK. So yesterday, I had the joy of being a guest of um, JetBlue Airlines for nine hours on a, on a flight here from Boston. We had a stop in Phoenix because they didn't have enough fuel. We're not going to let that go. But while I was doing that, I did text our marketing folks back home, and I'm like, can you put a couple of slides together for me, please? And of course, they helped me out. Sorry about that. So I'm Regina. I am the um, Senior Vice President of IT for UNOS. Um, I started with Pizzeria UNO in 2019. I'm sure that to the marketing folks, it seems like it's been a year longer. Um, I am a veteran of the multi-state, multi-unit, tipped environment restaurant industry for over 25 years. I prefer not to give the correct dates. Um, my headshot is at least 15 years old. But it's a good one. So if I speak in a couple more years, it's still going to be here, OK? And it's a, a, especially a disadvantage right now, because I'm speaking with, with Andrew. And his headshot from 2001 looks exactly the same as his one in 2023. And that, as I lived in the South, just that ain't right. And ain't right. And then my marketing team. I was not nominated for three Academy Awards. I was not the runner-up for the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize. However, lame squirrels, anybody who's in trouble, I will take it and I will help. Um, all around great gal. I hope so. Trying. So that's me. Okay, just a little bit about Unos. Um, Unos created Deep Dish. 
And normally, at this point in time, 10 years ago, we just dropped the mic. We invented Deep Dish. That's who we were when we were done. But it's a little more complex than that now. So in 1943, Ike Sewell created the first um, Uno Pizzeria at Wabash in Ohio in Chicago. It still stands today. Um, soon thereafter, uh, Douay, Uno and Douay, was built right across the street to, to take care of the demand. Now, I spoke with some Chicagoans today, and I heard that it's a big deal. You either grew up an Uno person or a Douay person. And I, I wasn't aware of that rivalry, but I've learned something here. Um, in 1979, Uno started franchising, and that's basically who we are today. We have about 30 corporate stores and about 45 franchisees. The exciting part is that in the last year, we have added, like COVID really didn't really, is it over? I don't know. Last year, we started adding franchisees, and we've added six franchisees in the last year, which is really exciting, especially coming off a pandemic as we did. Um, so in the first time, in 15 years, we added one. So we hadn't added anybody since 2008. So this is exciting. But I already said that. So what are we doing? Um, we are trying a new strategy. We are putting Uno's pizzerias in hotels. Now, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years, or months, excuse me, about the hotel business. Maybe not in Vegas, but what I understand is that hotel restaurants are a break-even at best. There are, you know, a cost of entry. You need to have, you know, that turkey club and that burger for whoever shows up. But what Unos is able to offer these hotels are some really nice advantages. First one is more revenue. How many times have you been in the lobby of a hotel that you're staying at and you see the pizza guy going upstairs? The pizza guy delivering to the front desk? Well, guess what? If you have a pizzeria in your hotel, you're going to get that revenue. You're also going to get third-party delivery. If you're in the neighborhood and there's a Marriott, and you're ordering Uno's, you don't care that it comes from the Marriott, you're getting Uno's. So they're also getting another channel with third-party delivery, which has been really successful. We have an improved cost structure. Um, most of the time in restaurants, in hotels, food costs, 35, 38%, you know, higher um, with the proteins and that type of thing. Even in this environment with um, the commodities and everything we're doing with, you know, purchasing and since the pandemic, we're about a solid seven or eight points lower than most, um, most regular restaurants. Pizza's, pizza's a good deal. The other thing that we offer is a low cost of conversion. You already have a hotel. You already have a restaurant. You don't need to put together a $2.5 million building in order to be able to open up. You got a kitchen. You got to buy a pizza oven. You got to change some things around, but it's a much lower cost of entry. And the good news is, is that this is all true. I was kind of skeptical last year. And of the six, they're either doubling and some are tripling the revenue from prior to being in Uno's Pizzeria. Um, and that's even pre-2019, pre so we're not comparing COVID numbers or anything. We're trying to make that real. So it's very exciting. And I think, oh, because I'm here with Patronix, I want to make sure everybody scan that QR code and sign up for our Uno's Extra program. If you're near any of the Uno's, you'll have a free pizza tomorrow in your, um, in your account. Jill, you need to do that. You live near one. Okay? And we're in 18 states, so hopefully we cover some of you. All right. I'll leave it back. Thank you. Okay. So, Regina, that's a great introduction. Thank you. So take us back to when you joined UNO's. What was it like and, and what did you need to change? Okay, well, I'm gonna give a couple of examples that might frighten some people that haven't been doing this for a long time. Let me give you an example. When I walked in there, we had Oracle Financial because at one point, UNO's had been much, much larger. And we were feeding Oracle Financial every month um, with a Lotus 123 spreadsheet. Yes, does any, everybody, who rem remembers Lotus here? Oh, thank goodness. Oops, I, I keep doing that, sorry. So um, we, um, and we had a COBOL programmer on staff to be able to pull all of those um, Lotus 123 spreadsheets put together and put it into a file so we can Im import it into Oracle Financial. I, I can't make this stuff up. So that was one of the things that we had to change. We also had about, oh, I don't know, probably six to eight different vendors all doing different things that came to about the cost of $1,200 per location per month. We had somebody for online ordering. And if I could talk about the online ordering, the online ordering vendor that we had, I'm not going to mention a name, was probably one of the best vendors I've ever run into. They did exactly what we said, and they customized the heck 
out of our um, online ordering site so that if we wanted to make a change, we'd had to give them two weeks notice to be able to make it because it was so complex. So we had that, we had, then we had a vendor for feedback, we had a vendor for um, an online ordering app that works sometimes, and then we had a loyalty program that honestly and truly added sometimes. So we were, you know, had a long legacy of um, items, and I said that Cobalt programmer to pull everything together, you know, before APIs. So we had a, we had a lot to change. And I think you had a, a pretty new team, and the team had a mandate to, to change technology and how you talk to guests. Yes, um, guest engagement, obviously, and this is right, I got there right before COVID. So you can only imagine how in the first eight to 10 months as the COVID pandemic hit, that this just exacerbated. We needed, we needed customer information. We needed to know who was taking our, um, our takeout and delivery, who was actually picking up, what could we do to manage the DoorDash accounts, all of that type of stuff. So it really just intensified. So you started with that. How did you get people on board to make change? Because I know this organization probably for a dozen years before you joined, and it seemed like they would you know, start doing something new and then pull back uh, when they had trouble with same store sales or something else. Yes, we yeah we we had coupon crack. We were on coupon crack too, but we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, one of the things that we had is that I we have a CEO who embraces change and change management. If there are a hundred good ideas, pick four, stick with them, follow them through. Um, it's harder to say no to a great idea than it is to say yes and then um, end up you know, falling into the abyss of just too many things and, and not being able to, you know, execute them all. So one of the things was to get CEO buy-in, and actually some of this change came from him. And, um, and then we really, really worked the project management, all the project management tools that I've used in the past, and I don't mean software necessarily, but we would have a meeting of everybody that had to be included in this decision every week, and we would talk about where we are, what the problems were, and what were the risks. One of the goals of that is we wanted to make sure that all of the water cooler folks that are like, oh, this is really awful, this is gonna destroy us, that we brought them all out into, you know, out into the, and we'd ask you, please, are you on board with this? If not, why? Tell us. We'll add it to the risk and we'll talk about it. There were no secret votes, there were no like nods of acquiescence. It was, are you on board or not? And if not, why? And oh my goodness, and I, I didn't employ this in the past, or I hadn't been as successful at doing that in the past, and we just had wonderful results. Yeah, I've seen Regina's style, and, it, and it's really amazing, because you bring people in, um, and then Regina always has options. So she always says, we gotta make a decision, we have two options, come on. And sometimes she would call us up and say, guys, we need two options. <laughs> Give me an option. Give I need an options, option. because the team and I think you do this on pur purpose, the team, you know, you end up with something, but it's a series of decisions that take you down a path, and you have to bring the team along with you, mm -hmm. and I, I think you employ this as a strategy, and it, and it seems to work really well for you. Um, and I have to say, it's been in this latest instance of my career that, and I think I give all this, my CEO, coach, all the coaching he gave me that we actually were able to do this, so it's cool. And I know getting the CEO involved, did you ever have to use kind of the hammer to bring the CEO in on tough decisions? Thou shalt, There'll be a thou shalt. One of the programs that we had, um, that we'd had for a long, long time was, you bought a pizza online, and you got the second one for $6. Um, guess where that came from? I don't know who remembers the Domino's, five bucks, five bucks, five bucks. So at one time, I'm sure that second pizza was $5, but it's $6, and they had looked at different online um, ordering providers prior to this whole transformation, and um, they can't do the extra pizza for $6. Because think about it, one of the things that they want to do, if there's any operators in the group, they'll understand, they didn't want to discount that second pizza to $6. They wanted that second pizza's price to change to $6. So it's one thing to say, go back to, you know, if you're discounting, but if you're actually changing the price of a menu item, let's think of the algorithm that was needed um, my first pizza is 20 bucks, perfect. My second pizza is $12.12. Well, I've got to take off $6.12 that time. Well, the next round, I have a $20 pizza, and the second one is $14.92. So I have to take off whatever that math is, you know what I mean, $8.92. And you had to do it. That's why that online ordering provider that we had 
had a week, two weeks to make a change because to set up something like that, it was just non-scalable, non-sustainable. But guys, we were gonna wreck the company and we were going under if we changed that. And we came up with a couple of other options. One of them was get one pizza, get the second one for 50% because it's easy to discount. You know, just that's always 50% off, whatever the second item is. Um, and we came up with one other option too, but you know what, we ended up doing the second pizza for 50% 50, 50 off and the company did not go out of business. In fact, we saw a huge reduction in our comps and discounts. And when you reduce your discount line, it goes directly to the bottom line. So everybody was happy. Yeah, how much did you reduce the discount line? I, I... This is the coupon crack story. So we were um, in the place where we were doing coupons all the time. And this is pre-COVID is what we're talking about. And so we probably had a discount line of 11%. But remember, think about all those second pizzas that we weren't discounting when we were changing the price. Our discounts were probably 14%. And um, now we're at a, set, a place where we're probably at 4%. But we have enough data that we're really looking at it to see Maybe maybe we need to lighten up on the yeah. discounts just a little. Maybe five or six percent is the right is the right amount. But we we using Patronics, we do have that data to be able to analyze it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, eleven to four percent, seven percent, straight to the bottom line. But that's scary. And when you are on coupon crack, like you said, almost no everybody. No disrespect to anybody that has an addiction, <laughs> please. I didn't mean to. Be Almost anybody um, backs away from it, like, you know, comp store sales. And I think, you know, part, you, you galvanized people to take this on. And I think maybe um, you were helped a little bit by COVID. Um, no, absolutely. Um, again, no disrespect to anybody. COVID was horrible. It was a horrible thing for this country. But there were some, some things that came out of it that were positive. And one of them was, I don't know if anybody was in the Boston area, but traffic on 128 was a dream during COVID. That was actually positive. <laughs> um, but one of the, you can't go home on a Friday night or a Sunday night as a restaurant company and then open up on Monday as somebody new. But you could over the course of COVID, you know? If anybody, if the people are only coming in with a coupon, as everybody's behavior changed over those, those what, three years, two years, three and a half, um, years, we were able to change who we are and, and mitigate that with, you know, using the one let a good crisis to go to waste. So we did use that. Yeah. So when you did this, was there any um, surprises on the positive side that maybe you didn't expect to happen when you took on this big project? Yeah. You know, one of them was um, we were paying a lot for feedback, guest feedback. And honestly, um, and we had devices at the table and servers wouldn't put them if they'd given, you know, lousy service. So we, we really weren't getting it. We were paying a lot of money for it. And so honestly, we hadn't even thought about it. But when we were using Patronix, someone goes, hey, what's this feedback, bu feedback button? We checked it. We are getting hundreds and hundreds of feedback every week on all locations. Um, and it's great because it's consistent. It's a five scale. You know, it's on the usual thing, service, you know, food, whatever. But it is amazing because it's actionable. And what the Patronix online ordering um, setup allows us to do, the managers get a ding as soon as they hear that. It could be right when the DoorDash driver leaves. It could be when the people get home, whatever. They can go online. They can find that order. They can email that customer immediately or through the DoorDash portal, whoever, and tell them, I am so sorry. Here's $10. Please come back. That's not normally what we do. And it's just been, this has been an amazing side effect that we, you know, number one, that we get the feedback, two, we can act on it, and three, we can go directly to the guest pretty much in real time. So that's been cool. And that was a surprise, because I don't think. No, we weren't thinking that. You knew we had this as a, as a no, product. Like, Let's just turn this on, see yeah. what happens. And we thought you would use their service. So I'll, I'll share some data on this, and then we'll go back and ask you what didn't go well uh, afterwards. Um, but on this feedback, so it's scale one to, uh, one to five, and um, in general, Uno's does 4.1. Like, so they do very well across the board. They can use this for isolating problems, operational issues by shift or by store. So that's you know, a great way to use this tool. The thing, uh, and there are over 23,000 of these, and I think you got more surveys through this tool than other stuff. Absolutely. And there's a 29% uh, increase uh, in uh, people coming if you respond. 
So anytime their staff responds to a review or a rating, people come back 29% more frequently than they were before. And so these are just some of the stats. This is um, before, after, so um, 30 days looking before that first survey uh, response. 30 days after, you see the 29%. And then when they come back, the survey ratings are higher. So you know they may have said you were 4.1, but when they come back the next time, it's up to 4.4, 4.5. Or in the case of it was 2.6, it's back up to four. And I want to let you know that we see in there, they're very obviously, very obvious to everybody, a one, a one across the board, five ones. And it, it galvanizes a lot of people's attention because the whole world gets copies on these. <laughs> that helps. And I guess the other is um, we're, we, we've got some AI to help um, detect not just the numerical ranking, but um, also sentiment. And so sometimes people will give you a four, but like, um, you know, if, um, uh, one of my daughters gives you a four, it's, it's, it's over for you. You know, it's the end of the world, but, and it might be in the words. So we do some AI for that. This is a response. So in the email, there can be a click here to resolve, a, um, and a click here preloads some of the words, and it can preload a coupon. And these are some of the responses to high value, and it puts the value of the person on the email to the GM. So this person's come in, um, they knew and had spent $1,700 at Uno's. They gave a 2.6 star rating. They bought a bacon cheeseburger and didn't get the bacon. So they were very upset about this. And it was a quick response. We apologize, we'll do better. Please come back. In this case, there was a coupon. And then since then, the person visited four more times spent a lot of money, um, and gave higher ratings in the future. And so they got the chance to, to make it right and, and get the customer excited. And there are tons of these uh, that they have. Um, and our latest thing is to actually uh, write some of the language with artificial intelligence, kind of the chat GPT. You know, another thing that the AI did for us is that, so we're using this for our online ordering, and we would, um, you know how can you're online ordering anywhere, they're like, hey, you really need to try this perfume, or you really you know, should add a cheeseburger or whatever. So what we had done is that we had put some of those automatic things in ourselves. Hey, every third person asked them if they want a dessert. So what we were able to do is that we did a test of ones that we had set up, and then ones that we let Patronics AI do, and it was like, obviously, AI works is the answer. There was like, I think, somewhere between 17 and 20% more of an acceptance rate of the AI suggestions. Like, I don't like dessert, but if it asked me, you want mozzarella sticks? Well, maybe, you know, I might consider that, you know? But that's not something that we would automatically think of when we set it up. So using the AI for that was, um, that was another cool surprise. So we got the, you know, customer engagement going, a loyalty program was put in. Mm -hmm. You've got, um, I think people were very nervous about the online ordering change. That went very well. Mm -hmm. The feedback, you know, I think you were starting to get data. People were buying in. This thing's working. We should move away from coupons. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, because I had this discussion with some folks that I had met in the last couple of days, and one of the things that we talked about, one person was absolutely adamant that, like, he can't make any money on a loyalty program. That it, it just doesn't, you just give stuff away and it doesn't. And you know what, I'm not 100% sure, but I do know this, it's the cost of entry now. It, it's just a table stakes. You know, you need an app that works and you need you know, a loyalty program, at least in the, in the mid casual dining market or, or quick service. Fine dining, obviously that may, that may vary a little, but I think it's table stakes, you just need to have it. Yeah. What didn't go well? So, you know, we've talked about all these things and it sounded easy. Oh yeah, I'm Can you like 35, <laughs> it was really easy. <laughs> what, you know, have you ever stumbled in this project or a different project? Yes, I always like to say it's never the technology, it's always the change management. Well, one time it was the technology. Um, we, I'm not gonna name the vendor, but we had implemented something um, to go with a suite of project, um, products. And it would be, the, it was the best thing since sliced bread because everything would be in one place. You'd have labor, you would have food costs, you would have sales. And um, one piece of the puzzle just wasn't ready for prime time. And we put that in and we really struggled to make it work. 
and we had to cave and put the other one back in. So, and it was the technology. I am since using that technology again five, six years later because it is ready for prime time, and that's great, but that was just, I think, um, I think it was just my error of pushing things along too fast. Yeah. Yeah, I um, remember doing a project. It wasn't when you were at this company, but uh, we put in a, a jump in line uh, seating system so that some of their high uh, VIP guests could take a different line, and um, we automated this uh, jump in line program. Uh, and it turned out that where they sent these people, there was no power and no internet. And so we worked out a wonderful solution with a tablet and all this other stuff. Actually, with Micros 3700 terminal, uh, and we couldn't use it because we couldn't power the terminals. That one's on me. I should have I should have figured that one out. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, and there was also, um, for that clientele, it was a very, very high-maintenance clientele as well to get their special white cards to jump the line. So, yeah, interesting, yeah. funny. Andrew and I have actually been doing this for um, 20 years, since 2003, I think, with five different clients. So um, Patreon has been a great partner for me personally, as well as the companies. Yeah, and I remember um, getting your CEO, um, I remember he wavered at one point um, and sort of, you know, can, can we get through to the promised land of digital guest engagement and, and sort of wavered? And working with Regina, you know, um, is always positive, always fast, like really short, fast conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's like, your team's doing great. This is wonderful. Love Robin, this and that. And then one day she, she will call and she'll say, I don't have time to explain it, um, but you need to be, you know, next week at our corporate office for one hour. Um, and, and I'll tell you on the way there, <laughs> but you gotta get my CEO yeah. um, on board. And I remember going through and, and um, we just pulled up the, the website and you couldn't stay on the website for more than two seconds before a $20 off coupon. Oh, that was, yeah, Uno's would, website. Would, yeah. would show up on the website. And like that was, it was like, is that, your view of the future. And that was kind of where we started. And was like, how do you stop that? And you need a transition plan, and that's yeah. how we got. And that was scary because, you know, we got a lot of those 20% off or $20 off coupons, and, you know, the operators honestly were panicked. And in, in all fairness, they were correct. I mean, what are we gonna do if they don't come in anymore, you know? We had an insiders um, club, um, just an email club, excuse me, and it had like 500,000 people, we're gonna lose all of them when we move over. By the time we got done, we actually had about, I think 98,000 people and only about 30,000 had actually been active, but because of the technology, we really couldn't tell who was active and who wasn't. And, and that's obviously something that we can do now. While we do use um, Patreonics Data Insights, which is you know uh, kind of an add-on to their program, but we get, um, I would say a better data scientist than myself, you know, or our marketing people um, to really kind of like slice and dice the data to give us some, some information. Okay. So one thing we wanted to do was open it up to ask uh, you what types of, you know, change management problems. Everybody in this room does change management um, for a, uh, a career and you stumble with uh, different things and do you have any questions uh, to ask for overcoming those things? in big projects. Questions, raise of hands. So it sounds like a, a very considerable amount of your tech stack has now been consolidated with Patronix. Mm -hmm. how, how were you able to do that so quickly and easily and how were you able to migrate the data from the plethora of vendors that you had before? You know what, um, great question. Great question, thank you, Wayne. Um, we, um, number one, what we wanted to do is we decided that once COVID hit that we were not gonna waste our time. We weren't gonna hunker down and wait. We were going to do a lot of, um, um, of changes and come out fighting at the end of the pandemic. You know, and so we just, you know, we made a list, we put our heads down. Like I said, we had project management meetings every week. And you know, there were times when my IT guys, my team, would be texting me like, oh my gosh, are you panicking? I'm like, yes, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm like, no, we just need to work through this. And I think once, it was very much um, a domino effect. Once you got one thing done, 
and the world didn't end, nobody died, no, there weren't, you know what I mean, we weren't bleeding cash or anything, you start to get more buy-in, and then it just got easier and easier because people were like willing to you know, make a change and or, or jump in. But um, we launched Patronix, I think we signed on January 15th, and we went live with Olo, Loyalty, and um, uh, Comp on uh, May 15th. So we got it done shortly, and, um, we, and we were able to export all of the other information that we had, and um, import it was pretty yep. easy, you know, they helped. A, a lot of that, the stuff that used to stymie us 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it's pretty easy now, you know, to, not necessarily easy, but it's a little more straightforward to export and re-import the information. And that's when we were doing that, that's when we found out that that whole 500,000 was really like 33,000. So it was a lot different. Hello. To, to achieve that level of survey responses, is that strictly organic surveys, or are you providing some type of incentive for your guests organic. to fill out the research? Yeah, all it's organic. All, it's that's all that's organic. Good number. And did you say it was table side? No, They're this doing... actually, the one we had before, this is from our online ordering. Do and online ordering. ordering and it's just, you want to give feedback, and it is just amazing the amount of feedback that we've gotten. All right, thank you. Yeah. So there, in the, you get two chances, um, but but essentially we um, you know send an email out to so solicit it, and it's delayed enough so that someone should have gotten their order and had a chance to eat it, but not so long that they don't remember. Um, but it's just organic, no no offers or anything else, and they get a lot of uh, very positive feedback. And then when someone's sad, they let you know too. I'm not sure sad is the exact word I'd use, but yes, yes. We, we are aware when someone's unhappy with our performance, yes. Over here. Moving from a highly customized online ordering solution, how did you get your operators on board with, you know, I'm, I'm assuming the older solution was probably like perfectly matched to exactly how they were operating oh, yes. to get them on board to move to something that's maybe not as perfectly aligned, but is more scalable. Okay, you know what? And that was really all of that project management, the getting all of the decision makers on the phone. And it was also having them test it and try it themselves and see, because when you go from an app from that's been around for 10 years, it's customized to like a white label app now, it's, you get 90% there out of the box. You know, and that's really, really helpful. And then, you know, of course, they're the ones that didn't like it, the naysayers. And then after two weeks, they kind of forgot what they didn't like about it. You know what I mean? It was really just the key is the day that we went live, online ordering worked. I said to everybody, I could care less if the loyalty plan doesn't work, the program doesn't work, and someone doesn't get their points or something like that happens. But obviously, especially since we rolled during the pandemic, you know, 40% of our business then was takeout and delivery. So we, we couldn't hesitate, you know? So yeah, it was, it was very, it was, I'm actually very proud of it and everybody involved in the, in the situation and grateful. Yeah, Regina does a really nice job of, um, cause there were a lot of those, you know, it, it's highly tuned to, to us and, and what we do. And in this second pizza for six bucks was part of the beauty and the problem. And, um, and so Regina's good at like, what's our goal? How do we get there? All these terrible things are still true. We just have to get over this road bump. And once we get there, life will be better. And um, you're really good at holding people to, the, to that and reminding them of, of, um, of what it's gonna bring. And then there were a lot of little data points. Things were working, things were getting better, comps were coming down. Um, we made a few people sign in blood, but other than that, it was a pretty <laughs> like, you know, easy process. With an integrated tech stack, you have the advantage of, like you were saying, scale and immediate functionality. But then there's maybe the disadvantage of best of breed in terms of the gap. Uh, you mentioned that, hey, 90% of the stuff was there, and that's in terms of meeting your requirements. What about with regards to where the market is moving? So not just the 100% that you're looking for, but maybe the 120 or 130% of the market changing and the like. How do you think about um, being able to keep up with all the changes that are taking place when you are kind of committed to an integrated tech stack? No, that is a great question. And that's why I particularly, um, honestly, um, partner with vendors that I know that are gonna grow. 
I, you know, I, I love Startup Alley. I love the whole concept of that here. But I might give them a couple years to get moving before I really, you know what I mean, get involved with that. But I partner with vendors, or I try to, the companies I work through, that are going to grow and learn. And th sometimes the vendor pulls us. They're like, hey, by the way, you know, we've added this. You know, the AI was a piece that we never thought about having them suggest, you know, mozzarella sticks instead of a dessert. And um, so I, I really think that it's the vendor selection and that you push your vendors and partner with your vendors to meet all those changes as they come up. And so far, I've been sort of lucky. Yeah, and I, I, you know, we have to make a promise to sort of keep pace, but then I think there's another sort of hidden thing that happens that um, Regina's team and the marketing team, some of their time's freed up from managing those two weeks, you know, when they wanted to change the other um, system, they had to like do a bunch of things and jump through ho hoops for two weeks. Well, now they do it themselves. It takes two hours and they have time to do more things. And I actually think you've been able to add some other people to the tech stack and to do trials with new tech um, to reach out into areas that maybe you wouldn't have been doing yep. if you were, you know, fighting the six vendors. And it costs a lot less which is obviously always, you know, the CFO side or the finance side, they're always thrilled with that. But it's definitely a balance, so that's a great question. Do we have time for a couple of questions more, I think? Anybody else? Okay. Well, okay. I don't see any more hands. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Sorry about my audio visual. I have to talk with my hands, and sorry about that. Yeah, no, just um, thank you all for coming, and, and Regina, thank you for sharing. Just, you know, I know, I think everybody has the same problem. How do you get buy-in? Just a real hard problem. How do you use top-down sparingly, uh, but when you need it, like for, to really push through? And for you, it was the, the $6 second pizza. Like, oh the, the team was stuck. My head was on a spit. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, use your, build the political capital and use it sparingly when you have to. And I think the other lesson was on managing the process and how to bring in more stakeholders, bring them along for the ride, and and do that um, by helping them make the choices, you know? And I it's think like, the, the biggest thing, excuse me, Andrew, is just consistent follow-up. You have to have a meeting every week on your project. And you have to talk about the things. What are we going to do this week? What did we do last week? What did we miss on? And it sounds so obvious until you actually do it and see it work. You're like, of course, but no, and here's the, is a project sheet. We pull it up. What's our goal? Now, here is the, um, you know, the things that we were supposed to get done. Did we? Why not? Oh, you were supposed to look at this. Why didn't you? And it's in a very non-confrontational manner. It's just we're going down the checklist. So it's, um, and everybody, after like the third week of a project meeting like that starts to follow up on all their stuff because you end up being, you know, just asked about it and not called on the carpet. We're just trying, we have a deadline. We're trying to meet it. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.